Good morning, everybody. Um, before uh, today, we are going to be continuing going through the book of Galatians. Uh, specifically, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 20. So if you would like to follow along, uh, please go ahead and turn there. Uh, we're not really going to be going a lot of other places today. But before we do get into that, I want to start by kind of sharing a story with you, as I tend to do, as most preachers tend to do, I guess. Um, <laughs> but uh, when I was a little kid, I grew up watching the show called Pokemon. And regardless of what you think about it, every single season, the main character would show up and he would have all of the experiences of the previous season. He would have all of the experiences of whatever battles he had gone through up to that point. He would know what he was doing, and then he would get to the new season, and he would immediately be like brought back to ground zero. It's like it's like he forgot everything. They had these enemies called Team Rocket who showed up all the time, and they would basically fall into the same pitfalls every single time. They would make the same mistakes, they would go through the same routine, and they would never really learn or grow. And I'm sure that a lot of us have met people that make us think of that. Like they, they, they seem like they just keep falling into the same trap over and over and over again. I know that sometimes when I've looked at myself, I've thought that of myself. I know that sometimes you've probably looked at yourself or your loved ones and thought, man, they really just keep falling for the same thing over and over again, or they keep returning to the same thing over and over again. And this is something that's evident throughout scripture. I mean, we're told, uh, like we are told that as a, as a, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a man returns to his folly. And it's just kind of this thing of like, we are going to make mistakes. We are going to have pitfalls that we keep returning to. Uh, it's just kind of like the nature of being a sinful human. And so this is a thing, this is a theme that Paul kind of starts this passage out with. Um, and he's specifically talking again to the Christians in Galatia, uh, to the church in Galatia, uh, and they've been they've been taken in by false teachers who have come in and started to spread uh, just legalism. They're, they're the Judaizers, they're the circumcision party, they're trying to uh, basically bring the law back. Uh, not saying that the law is bad or anything. In fact, Paul says that the law is a good thing, but they're trying to say that like you, ha like you have to have Jesus and the law in order to be saved. And Paul is very clear in the book of Galatians that it is Christ alone, by grace, through faith, that you are saved. That's what he, he's very clear about throughout this book. And so that's kind of what we're going to continue discussing today, but we're going to look at a slightly different side of it. Um, and we're looking at this idea of being taken in by these false teachings, even teachings that we once believed. So we're going to pick it up in verses 8 through 11 of Galatians chapter 4. And Paul says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature were not, are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Now, there is a personal connection here because Paul knew a lot of these people. He personally was the one who traveled and did the ministry that created the church in Galatia. Um, I mean, it was God through him. He didn't do it. But I mean, he was the one who God used in here in Galatia to get this church up and moving. And so he's got a personal element to it. He's like, man, I kind of feel like my work was wasted because you guys are all turning to this legalism. You're turning away from Christ and turning back to the old ways that you were doing things. I'm like, why? And I think this is a bit of the frustration that Moses would have felt when the Israelites left Egypt and were in the wilderness because they kept trying to turn back to the gods of Egypt. And again, we look at them and we say, why are you being so foolish? But many of us, many of you have had, have been walking with Christ for some time now. And I'm sure that there was a point after you accepted him, after you were saved, where you did kind of turn back. Maybe you just fell into a pit that you had previously been in, or maybe it was, you know, immediately after. Maybe it was something that you still struggle with. Maybe it was something that took a while, and then you just kind of 
maybe found a new pit, but you've accepted a master other than Christ. I'm sure that all of you have done it. I've done it. We have all accepted a master other than Christ since being saved. And this is what Paul is, you know, really kind of heat, hitting on here is this idea that these people, they've been saved. They, they should know God. They should not be giving in to these other masters, but it's something that has happened all throughout human history. And it's something that God is not unfamiliar with. Uh, so we have this and they're returning to the legalism. Again, the Judaizers bringing in this idea of you need to do Jesus and this in order to be saved. And, and I think that part of this comes back to this whole idea that I believe we find comfort in weak gods. I believe that we find comfort in the things that are not all powerful because there is some degree of control that we can have over them. I would argue that we don't really have control over them, but we can make it seem like we do. Uh, like when our God is money, uh, we can we can work harder, we can work more hours, we can get a different job. Uh, when our God is um, when our God is like you know pleasure, we can pick the foods that we want, we can have the partners that we want, we can uh, play the games or sports that we want, we can eat and watch and do whatever we want. We live in a day and an age where it's easy to really just kind of get your hands on whatever you want. Um, within reason, obviously, like I can't just go out and buy a rocket ship. I mean, I probably could. I, I don't have the capital to do that, but I, if I did, I'm sure I could. Uh, <laughs> but like it, we just have things at our fingertips that most of human history didn't. And so like we have the ability to do that. And sometimes we let those things be our gods. Maybe it's yourself. It is much harder to control yourself, but it's pretty easy to look at yourself and say, I am divine. I am worth it. And to just kind of like give yourself over to whatever you want, whatever your heart desires. Um, and so I think that we like weak gods because we feel like we can control them. We like weak masters. We like the ones that aren't actually God. Because if God is real, and if God is all-powerful, and if God is all-knowing, and if God is the only source of repent, like the only source of salvation, then that means there has to be submission. We don't like submission, unless it's to the things we like submission to. And so I think that there's a lot here that Paul's kind of getting into, but this main idea is that uh, he's talking to this group of people who should know better, but they keep giving themselves over to these false teachings, to this false practices. We do that. We fall victim to that probably every day. And then Paul continues, and this part's a little bit more difficult to really wrestle with, but in verses, um, verses 12 through 16, he says, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? I think there's a lot to be gathered here, a lot to really think about here. Um, now, there's some historical context here uh, where the Galatian church, uh, the people in Galatia, uh, may have been a people who at one point believed that a God in human form came through. And when they did not show them hospitality, uh, havoc was wreaked. And so they were a people who tried to show, show hospitality very well to everybody. And because of the miracles associated with the ministry of Paul, they probably did actually worship him as though he were a God or want to worship him as though he were a God. Um, and he probably set them straight and was like, no, it's Jesus Christ who is God, um, not me. I am just... A messenger that he has sent, basically. And now he's looking at that and he's saying, you were so, you had so much fervor. You had so much zeal for, for the message that I brought when I came through initially, even to the point where you would tear your eyes out if I asked you to, which is not a small ask. <laughs> um, but he's saying, you know, you were so committed. What happened? 
Like, where did that go? Is it just because I've started preaching the truth to you? Um, or because I've been preaching the truth to you that you're turning away? And I think that happens sometimes in our churches. I think that happens sometimes just in life that like, when the truth comes, oftentimes we may not want to hear it. And so we will ignore the people who proclaim the truth or we will defame them or we will just decide that they're not worth giving our time to anymore. Um, I mean, I mean, John in his gospel account talks about this. Like we live in darkness in the world before Christ. We like we're in a world of darkness. And when light comes into the darkness, it hurts and it, it terrifies those who are in darkness because they love the darkness. They love the secrecy. They love the hiddenness of it. But when the light comes in, things get brought to light. And that's that's a scary prospect for those who are in the darkness. And so preaching the truth, even if you're somebody that is well-liked and well-loved by everybody, preaching the truth to a degree has some sense of rejection to it because the flesh and the world will reject it. But Jesus gives us comfort in that he says, when the world rejects you, he doesn't say if, he says, when the world rejects you, know that they rejected me first. So we are not doing this alone. We are just following in the footsteps of Christ in those moments. Now, I think that you, you have to do that in love. I don't think walking up to complete strangers and saying, you're a sinner, you're going to go to hell if you don't have Christ is the best way to do things. I don't think that's like you're going to make enemies that way. And I don't think our job is to make enemies. I think making enemies is a byproduct of preaching the gospel, but the gospel is that God in his grace is saving you by Jesus Christ, by your faith in him from yourself and the sin and the punishment for the sin that you have brought upon yourself. And people don't like to hear that they're the one at fault. But the point of the gospel is not necessarily that. The point of the gospel is that even though we couldn't do this on our own, God made a way. Like, it is good news. But sometimes people don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear that good news. Um, especially if they are a person who tends toward legalism. Uh, I, I've noticed in my own life, it's really easy to like take a list of rules and to follow that list of rules. And to be like, okay, you've checked off everything on the list. That means you're good. It's really hard to live a life in grace. Like it's easy, but it's hard because like when you have a true understanding of grace, when you've actually been changed by grace, it will play out in the rest of your life. But it's hard to measure that. It, it really is. Um, and so I understand why like legalists would not like the doctrine of grace <laughs> because it makes it more difficult to say who's good and who's bad because the truth is none of us are good enough and we shouldn't be keeping metrics that way anyways, but that's what we like to do because we're flawed, we're fallen, we're legalists. We really are. And so that's kind of what's going on here, but the truth will drive them away sometimes. The truth will drive people away, even if they seem fervent in the beginning. And so Paul concludes this passage uh, in verses 17 through 20. And I know we're kind of just blazing through this, um, but there's just not as much that needs to be taken into as deeply right this minute. And we will kind of reiterate this again as we go, because a lot of what Paul says is just repeating himself throughout the book. But um, in the next few verses, the final few verses, uh, verses 17 through 20, Paul says this, he says, those people, and I think he's referring to the false teachers here. Uh, he says, those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I'm with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. So Paul again is saying he's confused. He doesn't understand why they've turned away from the gospel of grace to this fake gospel, uh, to this fake new like <laughs> fake news, but to this fake news of like you have to do this, this, and this as well. And uh, he he points out like these teachers are zealous, like they have a lot of charisma, they have passion behind what they're saying, and they are charismatically and passionately like sending you in the wrong direction. 
I don't know about you guys, but like if you pay attention to the world that we live in today, everybody gets really passionate about a lot of things. Um, and, and I think that like there's a new trend to be passionate about every couple of months. And the thing that everyone is really on fire for right now, three months down the road, there's going to be a new thing and they're going to forget about this. Like they are. Like I remember when uh, there were terrorist attacks in France and Paris and everybody posted like on their Facebook, the pray for Paris thing. Nobody has that anymore unless they just forgot to turn it off or stopped using Facebook at that time. Like, does that mean Paris doesn't matter anymore? Does that mean there's not an issue anymore? What if I told you there is an issue still? In, France, in Paris. Like, what if I told you that there are still things going on in the world that aren't Israel and Palestine or that aren't uh, Butker or whatever, the, the chief's kicker uh, giving a speech at a Catholic school? Like, what if I told you that there are things in the world going on besides those and that we should be caring about those and not just passionate about whatever's popular on social media on a given day? But that's the thing is like, people go missing and things happen and there are tragedies all over the world. And every single day, the news puts new ones in front of you. Like, and we're expected to be passionate about them, to care about them, to be zealous about them. We can't, it's not healthy to be that way. It's not healthy to be outraged by every little thing. There are things that do matter and that we do need to stand up against and that we do need to stand up for, especially as Christians. But we need to be zealous for Christ. If you are truly zealous for Christ, you will stand up against the things that he would stand up against. You will stand up for the things he would stand up for. But you need to be zealous for him, not for the causes, not for the not for whatever social media is talking about that day. Be zealous for Christ and you will do the things that he would do, that he would have you do. And you can't just do it when the right people are looking. That's kind of what Paul is getting at there is he's like, be zealous always, not just when I'm here. The people in Galatia have been lax in their faith when he was gone. In fact, they've gotten zealous for other things. And it's like, no, no, no. Just because I left you, just because I went to go continue doing ministry doesn't mean you can stop doing the work that was started in you. Keep moving. Keep growing. Let Christ grow in you and become like him is what Paul is saying. He's like, I am in child, like in the pains of childbirth because I want Christ grown in you. He's calling them children. <laughs> and, and like, I, I think that happens a lot is like, we look at people that we work hard for, uh, to, to push toward Christ or to, to raise or to help learn about life. And we see that they, they keep falling into the same pitfalls. They aren't learning from their mistakes. They're not growing at the rate we, that they should be or something along those lines. And it's, it's painful because we care about them. We want what's best for them. And Paul sees that. And so this all kind of goes together where he's like, I wish I could be with you so that I could understand you better and I can change my tone because I want to help. I want you guys to do well. And ultimately, what all of this kind of boils down to, and, and this is where we're going to land, but like what all of this boils down to, I'm going to say is two things. One, we are in Christ. We are saved by Christ, for Christ, in Christ. That's it. We are in Christ. If we are in Christ, there is nothing else that can save us. And there's nothing else that can save us regardless. But I mean, like in Christ, you are saved. Okay. Don't give in to legalism. Don't give in to the other like teachers, the false teachings of this world, because they will try to sway you and they will be charismatic and they will be zealous and they will have a list of reasons for why you ought to go their way and why you ought to follow them and why you ought to be passionate about this until the next thing comes along. And there are things we need to be passionate about. Do not hear me wrong. There are things that we need to be passionate about. There are things that are worth outrage but not everything. We can't be. If you are passionate about Christ, if you are zealous about his mission for you, about his mission for all of us, if you are zealous about his kingdom, then you are going to be outraged at the right things. Then you are going to be passionate about the right things. Then you are going to stand up for or against the right things. You're going to make mistakes because you're human. You're not perfect. Neither am I. 
But as we follow Christ, there are going to be things pulling us in every direction, and we need to have the discernment to walk with him through them. And at the end, to remember that his grace is sufficient. Because we are going to fail. There are going to be times where we maybe take the wrong stance. Grow. Become more like Christ. Learn from it. At the end of the day, what matters is that we go to the one who can save us not only in eternity, but also today. Go to the foot of the cross. Go to Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, you are good. Uh, thank you for giving us an opportunity to be here, to dive into your word, and uh, just to see what what you do have for us. God, as we go into the rest of our weeks, let us be a people who are known for our love for you, um, that we are that we are being made in your image every day, and that uh, people who look at us see you in us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for all the good that you do and all the, all the lives that have been changed in you and let ours be counted among them. Thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, guys. We'll see you later.